<clears throat> welcome wrestling fans welcome welcome to curtain jerk and as always i'm your host jacob grandi reporting for the main event marsh youtube channel you can also check me out on spotify however you're listening to my voice i appreciate it we had a big night in pro wrestling last night aw dynasty great show we're going to rank every single match from worst to first we have a possible match of the year candidate on there but I'm not going to, you know, spoil the whole podcast for you. I do want to get into a Bullet Club Gold unifying the two six-man tag titles. This was on the pre-show. I ranked every single match from, you know, the regular show, the proper AW Dynasty. Um, but I did catch a little bit of this match. This was a good match. But everyone was talking about Max Caster's rap. I didn't really think of anything of it, but I guess he was alluding to. Um, well, he didn't allude to. He said that you're going to have to tell the legal team the taste of his dick. I guess people are saying that that was a reference to the Vince McMahon allegations. I don't know. Um, but then, you know, people are saying that Max Caster fell off and all these things. I was like, dude, okay, I guess he was a tag champ and now he's not a tag champ. But I think, you know, the acclaimed great, you know, Great act on TV, great tag team, great team. They're given like kind of shit for storylines recently. They don't really seem to know what to do with them. But maybe these unifying of these uh, these trios titles will help them do something, move somewhere, wrestle somewhere. Uh, you know, figure something out. Get the, get these six man these trios titles off of them, and uh, let them become a tag team again. You know, maybe wrestle the new champs, the young bucks. But let's get into it, ranking every single match from worst to first, all nine matches. These shows are long. A lot of people should talk AEW for their weekly programming. There's no stories, um, but they definitely deliver on their big shows. I was thinking, man, what is what, what, what show was better than this? This might have been the best AEW show of all time, and then it hit me. Oh, wait, March. March had just as good of a show, arguably, with uh, Revolution. So they're on a roll here, and they're having great pay-per-views. If you want to shit talk the weekly show and how the stories are kind of all convoluted and too many shades of gray, I'm with you. I'll, I'll, you know, I'll support your statements there. But if you want to shit talk the entire company... I'm not going to be with you there. These big shows, these pay-per-views deliver, and they're two sellouts. Last March, or this March was a sellout, and uh, last night was a sellout as well. But we did have a dud on the show. Hook versus Jericho. Hook taking Jericho to Suplex City. Throws an elbow with so much air between it, you could have, I don't know, uh, it could have been made with a windmill, the amount of air. It, it powered the city of St. Louis with how much wind was being whiffed by Jericho's face here. This elbow did not land, but Jericho acted as if it did. Jericho sets up a table. Hook gets a trash can lid. Hook puts Jericho through a table. This looks sloppy and stiff. Um, Jericho kicks out. Crowd is chaining. Go home, Jericho. I mean, Jericho has that weird heat where, you know, that NDA heat, if you know what I'm talking about, uh, the heat of, you know, maybe he's an old guy in the promotion holding young guys back, even though, I mean, he only kind of only works with young guys and, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a weird thing to talk about. I think in his mind, he's helping and in the fans minds, he's hurting and, um, they're, you know, that's just what's happening here. So every Jericho match doesn't have that that fire, that sizzle that you're really looking for in an AEW match. T-Bone suplex while Jericho was in a trash can. That was a cool spot. Uh, Jericho kicks out again, but this match did drag. Hook uh, moves. Uh... Oh yeah, Hook just moves from Jericho diving off the second rope. Red rum, Jericho falls back through a table to break it up. Jericho, uh, you know, kind of gets the leverage here uh, with this with this pin attempt, but he even kicked out of that. So he put his feet on the ropes. One, two, Jericho kicks out from having, or Hook kicks out of, from Jericho getting that leverage, which maybe that might, uh, you know, downplay 
any other time you want to use that. I would. I was not a fan of them using that uh, that technical wrestling spot in this hardcore match. Sloppy uh, counting from the ref here. The crowd. Some of the members of the crowd thought it was three. This match just did not connect. Lion Tamer locked in. Low blow to hook. Camera didn't catch the low blow though. Judas effect. One, two. Hook kicks out of the Judas effect. Jericho drops another one. One, two. Hook kicks out again. Jericho gets a bat. Says, don't make me do this. And Hook just flicks him off. I actually like that spot. Don't let me do this. Fuck you. Boom. Connects with the bat. One, two, three. Jericho now has the FTW title. The story was good at the end here. Don't make me do this, but then he does it. Now he has the FTW title. I think they're going to do a similar storyline that they did when Jericho had the Ring of Honor title. Like a guy who doesn't care about the history of this and is just kind of flaunting it around because he, you know, he thinks he's the best. Uh, that's why every match, uh, uh, I think like Hook sucks. And I think like every match he's in has to be this hardcore style, this brawl. Um, to cover up, you know, that he, you know, he might not be as good as you might often need to be to be in AEW or, uh, or whatnot. I mean, just compare him to, uh, Colton Gunn, someone who exclusively wrestled only in AEW, just like Hook, and they've been around about the same time now. There's something going on where Colton gets it, and Hook, I don't know, maybe it might be his character to stand there and be tough, but I don't get it. I don't like it. Um, they do a lot to cover him up. They're like, oh, he's going to stand stoically because he can't talk. And because he can't wrestle, he'll put people through tables and destroy people without like having you know, a real competitive match. You're doing all this to cover up somebody who, why, you know, with Jade, I get it because Jade has the star appeal, passes, passes the airport test. So I understand working hard to cover up Jade's weaknesses, but I don't understand working hard to cover up Hook's weaknesses. I don't think there's as much upside to doing this, um, exposing things like, you know, the leverage on the, you know, putting your feet on the, the second rope when you're pinning somebody, um, having bigger guys get destroyed by Hook, um, you know, it doesn't, I don't know, it doesn't add up. And I think when Hook came out, people like ironically liked him. And for some reason, they kind of forgot that it was ironic. They, they, you know, everyone's like all in on Hook a few years ago. And it seems like people forgot that that was uh, irony. And now we have to watch Hook wrestle. And Jericho was getting a lot of the heat here. People didn't like Jericho online and on Twitter comparing him to Hulk Hogan and TNA and everything like that. But it was... Jericho, who was doing the great work here, Hook and Aubrey Edwards weren't firing on all cylinders here in St. Louis, but that was the worst match on the show. The eighth match on the show, this was good, was Willow versus Julia Hart for the TBS Championship. Willow's family in attendance almost gave away the ending right then and there. Willow barks now, I thought. She was just barking to taunt Brody King, but no, she's barking a lot now, so... That's too much of a distinct uh, thing or taunt to have two people that aren't in a feud with one another do in AEW, I think. Uh, Julia goes for a moonsault, eats a boot, lariat, straps off, powerbomb, one, two, three, Willow wins. Uh, don't like the barking, but like the title change, and I like Willow. Stokely and Statlander out there to celebrate with her, but then the music hits. CEO, CEO, CEO. I'm glad the music was doing the chanting because the crowd really didn't give a shit, it seems like. I feel like she has kind of already lost her momentum from coming in and she doesn't feel special anymore. It's going to be really hard to build that momentum back without her wrestling before this pay-per-view and the pay-per-view is going to be her debut like two months after um you know debuting in the company uh so i don't i think that this is already a flop this sasha banks thing is already a flop and i knew it was going to be because you can compare it to when they brought Paige in or soraya in they don't know really what to do with these these star women, these special women, they don't really know how to push them, it seems. It seems. Maybe they do, but there's something that's getting lost in the shuffle here. But that was number eight. Number seven, Tony Storm with Luther and Murray May versus Thunder Rosa. 
tornado crossbody taking out Timeless and Luther at the same time. Power bombing the champ, 1-2. She kicks out. Crucifix, 1-2. Champ still kicks out. Death Valley Driver on the apron. Crowd split but hooked. Uh, backstabber and DDT from the champ. Tony controlling the pace here. Deanna Perrazzo comes out, takes out Luther, and fights Mariah May to the back. And Tony goes for a running hip attack. Storm Zero, 1-2. No, locks in the clover leaf. Rosa struggling but gets to the ropes. Tony hits a low blow. That's right. Tony hits a low blow to Thunder Rosa. Storm Zero, one, two, three. A low blow in a women's match. A boot under the blouse. Putting the V and V trigger. A kick below the kidneys. A mule to the muff. This was interesting. This was fun. Uh, Tony Storm is great. I love the whole thing. I mean, Mariah May is hot. She comes out. There, there's going to be some kind of looming tension there. Luther is great in his role as this butler. Just the whole thing is great here. She just is on an island onto herself as far as the women's division. But, you know, you are heating up. Willow, she's great. I liked that they gave Thunder Rosa another title opportunity. You have that looming um, tension that I already spoke about with Mariah May. So you can do things for the next six months with Tony Storm as his champion. I, I even forgot about Deanna Perrazzo. That feud is still going on. I think that uh, all this talk about you know people missing Jamie Hayter and where's Britt Baker, I don't care. I don't care. I like Hayter. I like, I like Baker to an extent. But I think anything that will disrupt what Tony Storm is doing right now is not the best thing to do in the women's division. That's why I think, honestly, Mercedes Monet is going after that TBS title um, because they know that they got something here with Tony. Everyone knows. But number six, Roger Strong versus Kyle O'Reilly. Solid video package uh, before the entrances. This was a well-built match. Uh, they knew they were in the middle of a long show and they were going to hook this crowd by you know starting off slow. O'Reilly going after the leg of the champ. Strong connecting with a bunch of backbreakers as he does. Two lariats at the same damn time. Both men down. Wardlow comes out. Ref keeps him at bay, but he stays out there. Kyle goes after the arm. End of heartache. One, two, three. Roderick Strong retains. But what was the point of Wardlow being out there? The rest of Undisputed Kingdom... On the top of the ramp, Adam Cole gets out of the wheelchair, comes down to the ring, wearing that devil mask shirt, uh, you know, kind of reminding everyone of how Undisputed Kingdom formed and how shitty that storyline was. But he doesn't let his eyes off of Wardlow. He's staring at Wardlow, probably wondering, hey, why the fuck were you out here, man? Um, for a little bit longer than you would just look at somebody. And then even when they were leaving, he's looking at him. This was great here. Adam Cole had... A small piece part on the show and nailed it. Uh, and, and he's standing up. I mean, you know, he's out of the wheelchair. Is he healthy? I hope so. You know, yes, this storyline with, uh, you know, Wardlow leaving this faction is kind of a rehash of when he left Pinnacle with MJF. But they're doing it well so far. Wardlow's great. Adam Cole's great. Uh, I think they can work well together. So if this is a slow built storyline, maybe going all the way even into Wembley, I would uh, I would enjoy it. But this match was number six. It didn't crack the top five. What did crack the top five was House of Black versus Adam Copeland, Mark Briscoe, and Eddie Kingston. Nice six man tag here. Brody King and Eddie Kingston. This is something I'd like to see more of. Mark Briscoe and Buddy Matthews. We've seen it before. Let's let's see it again. I think these pairings are all great here. Uh, Mark runs on the apron and uses a chair to hoist himself over the post, landing on, I think, Brody King. Kingston and Mark uh, go for a double-team suplex to Brody, get cut off by Malachi and Matthews hitting stereo power bombs, only for Copeland to run up the rope and hit a superplex by himself to Brody King off the top rope. All six men down. Froggy Bow, one, two, no. Matthews breaks it up. Copeland missed it, then gets his head kicked off. One, two, three. House of Black win. This was a great match and set up a good TNT title match down the road. Black versus Copeland. Sign me up. That's a main event anywhere. And uh, I think, you know, 
going into the six man tag, like I said, these pairings are great, but the whole reason to do it, you could see it from a mile away, was get Black and Copeland to go at it. And look at me, I'm not calling him Edge, I'm calling him Copeland because he's been doing great work. I think this run in AEW is better than the last few years of him in WWE. Number four, not even making the podium, but is, you know, could have been match of the month. And, you know, if you told me that this was your favorite match of all the whole month, I wouldn't bat an eye, but it's the fourth best match on the show, in my opinion. These next matches are all going to be good. Didn't even make the fucking podium. Okada versus Pac. Holy shit, chance off the bat. Pac grounds the Rainmaker and brings him to the floor. Okada cuts him off uh, when he goes up top. Uh... Okada is able to hit a drop kick, sending him to the floor. Drop kick again in the center of the ring. Pac hits a moonsault to the floor. Pac in at five. Okada comes in at eight. Missile drop kick from the challenger. Champ replies with a drop kick of his own. Like JR said, ain't nobody does it better. Ain't nobody does it better. The drop kick than Okada. Drops him with a neck breaker. One, two, no. Okada goes for the rainmaker pose, but then. As uh, as it you know, as he's supposed to extend his arms, he just gives two middle fingers to St. Louis. Finally, getting a little heat. Finally, getting a little heat here. This new lease on life. Him being elite, um, supposed to be a heel, but everyone cheers for him because he's Okada. Here he is getting some booze. Fuck Okada chance. Deadlift German from Pac. One two no. Black Arrow. No one home. Tombstone pile driver from Okada. Pack locks in a submission. Okada rakes the eyes uh, to break up the hold. Tombstone from Pac here goes up top. Okada pulls the ref in between them. Uh, black, but then the ref kind of fights him off. Pac able to go for the black arrow. Knees up. Rainmaker. One, two, three. Okada gets the victory. That was the first match on the show. And I thought that was going to be the best match on the show. Until the final three matches on the show came to be. And they were just all fucking great. The Young Bucks versus FTR. Action moving quickly in the early going. Uh, Vacant tag team titles. Dax tossing Nick uh, on the ladder. Backdropping Matt on the ladder. As Cash sets up some tables on the outside. Bucks get the upper hand on Dax. Um, He's busted open. Cash sliding under the ladder. This was a cool spot. So they... They Irish whip him into a ladder that's draped on the apron and the guardrail. He slides under it, jumps on top, hits a moonsault. I'm just thinking, like, God damn, how long would it take me to do that? Get on top of a ladder that's that high, turn around on the ladder, and do a flip? The flip is off limits. I can't do that fucking flip right there. But to just pop up on a ladder, turn around, and then hit another, like, that's just that, even that little moment right there of athleticism. I wouldn't be caught dead doing. Let's go back to the match. Um, v, uh, the, so they, they, Cash jumps on the ladder again. They rack him. He falls nuts first. And then they hit the EVP trigger while he's still like, you know, hanging from his nuts. Uh, Doomsday Bulldog in the ring when the FTR get the upper hand. Sharpshooter. And then Cash puts uh, the, the, the ladder like, so the bottom rung is holding Matt's back down as he climbs the ladder. Nick fights that off. Slingshot powerbomb, always a sick move. Cash dives on Matt. Uh, he went th- uh, through, like Matt went through a table like ass first and his head bounced off the guardrail. Hurricane Rana, uh, Dax barely breaks the table. That looked crazy. FTR takes off Matt's shoe for some reason to stop him. Power and glory off the ladders. That spot was great. Nick hits a 450 off the top rope through a ladder to the floor. Dax hits a pile driver uh, through a, a draped ladder to the floor. They're just going off here. Cash flying through the ropes. Nick moves and he just eats shit through a table that he set up earlier in the match. Please be careful, Chance. What a dumb fucking chant here. Nick and Dax climbing the ladder. Someone... In a sting mask shows up, or maybe it was a V for Vendetta mask, I don't know, pushes Dax off the ladder. Security guards grab him, unmask him to reveal that it's Jungle Boy Jack fucking Perry, the man, the provoker of CM Punk, cry me a river himself, and as he's getting thrown 
out, he's thrown up the the elite hand gesture. Um, Okada is going to look like a camp counselor or something with this faction. All three of these young California boys, about five foot eight, and then you got that you know the six man or the the six foot guy standing behind him with the title. But you know the young bucks get the titles. This is something new here. Um, I'm I'm in I'm. I'm not necessarily into Jungle Boy, but let's keep this going here. Let's add a little story to this. I guess, you know, it does make sense of why they showed the footage to begin with. And Jungle Boy is back in AEW. And that's number three, the third best match on the show. Number two, the main event. Joe versus Swerve for the world title. Swerve with the Black Panther mask, entrance gear and everything. Marching style music before his song kicks in. And right then and there, I was like, he's winning this fucking title. Why would they give him this huge entrance without putting that title on him? Nana saying whose house? All of St. Louis knows whose house it is. It's fucking Swerve's house. Joe throws him onto the announcer's table. He's trying to... uh, you know, keep the title. He's staying in control on the outside and back in the ring. Joe sweeps the leg of Swerve at one point. That was cool. Pop Nigel McGinnis. He called it a barrel kick. And this looks, you know, this looked pretty slick. Joe is definitely in control up until this point. But then Swerve slowly getting the momentum on his side, going after the arm of Joe. Muscle Buster. One, two. Swerve kicks out. Joe can't believe it. They do protect this move a lot. There's a lot of two counts uh, throughout this show and all throughout AEW, but they protect the Muscle Buster, and Swerve just kicked out of it. 450 on Joe as Joe's trying to get back into the ring. Swerve stomp. One, two. Joe kicks out. Swerve cuts off the rear naked choke and after and goes after the arm of the champ again, stomping on Joe's arm, uh, creating a nasty pop here. House call one two no. Power bomb to Joe. Power bomb to Samoa Joe, the much larger man. No. Swerve stomp and then as as he goes up top to do the swerve stomp, he stands on the top turnbuckle and you just there's this this shot with everyone in the room standing as well they know what time it is they know whose house it is it's swerve's house one two three the right guy won the most over guy won in the last few months uh since mjf left i would say this is the guy who you kind of felt like maybe was the world champion this was the right time here uh the beginning half of the year as yeah like as you don't have mjf around and as you know jericho's losing favor um, you know, you have a lot of these guys who, you know, Omega is not around. You have a lot of these guys who are just like go to wrestlers in AEW and they were gone. And Swerve was just there and everyone wanted Swerve to kind of have this title for, I think, since at least since 2024 started, if not longer. And they milked it. I wanted them to do it in March. The in hindsight, that wasn't the right time. It's also good because, you know, first ever black AW champion, of course, um, but also the first guy and the only guy, in my opinion, who's become a bigger star since leaving WWE and coming to AEW. So that, much like Cody leaving AEW and going to WWE, and then WWE being able to say, like, look, we made him an even bigger star, AEW can now do that with Swerve. AEW can say, like, you didn't know how to use this obvious star you had him wasting away on smackdown after he proved himself to be someone of note in nxt you didn't do shit with him and then he came over here and he became a huge star um the counter argument to cody is now swerve and i think that's big i think you need to keep the title on him for for a long time whose house it is swerve's house was he a heel? Did he break and enter into a few people's homes? Yeah, um, but no one cared. Everyone thought he was fucking cool anyways. I've been saying it for months. People forgot about all that shit. And now that he's over, now that he is a face, you can slowly get people to forget about that shit. Push it away. Don't have him do any of that shit anymore. Nana coming out with the dancing and just the whole package is great. Um, shout out to Joe great title run um uh, well he was a great champion but i don't know about a great title run um he got the title because undisputed kingdom kind of uh you know wanted to screw over mjf 
and then he was kind of the guy who had it instead of Swerve, but it's kind of cool that he had the AW Championship this far into his career. But that wasn't even the best match on the show. Number one, Osprey versus Danielson. Bell rings, crowd cheers. Fun to see them not chant at first, but have a genuine reaction to what they're about to see. Match picks up a little bit, tit for tat. Osprey's chest getting red early. Danielson's chest getting red early. Osprey is more popular than Danielson in St. Louis. It feels like Danielson uh, tying him in knots here. Osprey able to get to the ropes, but still hurting. Osprey sky twister pressed to the floor. Back in the ring, he lands an elbow. Hurricane Rana from Osprey or uh, to Osprey, but Osprey lands on his feet. Tiger suplex off the top. Osprey really selling his neck here. One, two, foot on the ropes. Yes, kicks. Osprey drops him with an elbow. Yes, kicks on the apron. Cut off into an os cutter onto the apron. Danielson gets in at eight. Huge power bomb from Osprey. One, two, no. LaBelle lock in the middle of the ring. Danielson uh, pulls uh, back the the other arm of Osprey here. Osprey in trouble, but able to put his foot on the rope to break the hold. Yes, kicks again. Power bomb countered by a Hurricane Rana. Uh, by Danielson. One, two, Osprey kicks out. Osprey misses the hidden blade. Danielson hits the Psycho knee. One, two, Osprey kicks out. Danielson lands these like stomping blows, just like you know the Blackpool Combat Club is is one to do. Uh, yes, no dueling chance from this crowd. Osprey fighting off the LaBelle lock. Osprey landing some elbows on a you know. Uh, a laid down Danielson. Danielson locks in a triangle. Osprey power power bomb one arm power bombs out of that. Danielson still doesn't let go. Osprey able to turn it into a Styles clash strike battle. Osprey reeling German suplex. Osprey hulks up from getting hit with a German hidden blade. Os cutter uh, gets cut off by the Basico knee. That spot was wicked. It nailed it. Nailed it. Uh, Fine precision here. Osprey takes off the elbow pad to stop the yes chance. Charges. Uh, Danielson charges at Osprey. Osprey charges at Danielson. Osprey able to hit the hidden blade. Tiger driver. Danielson squirming in pain. Ref is trying to call for the bell, but as he's looking to call for the bell, hidden blade. Boom. One, two, three. Will Osprey beats Brian Danielson. The announcers are talking. To, all about Danielson. They're concerned, uh, but Danielson looks, he looks hurt. I hope he's not hurt. They were keeping the camera on him, which makes me think that, um, you know, that he's, he's not really hurt. They, I think that the announcers wouldn't have talked about it as much as they did. And I think, um, the camera would not have stayed on him as, as long as it had, had he been really hurt, but he got me there. Danielson got me there. There was this crazy shot of Will Ospreay celebrating and Danielson squirming in pain while like three or four um, officials are looking over him, not knowing what to do. Um, I don't know what was going on there, but man, what a show. What a match. Let me know your rankings and how you would rank this show. Fly high. I'm out.